Jack Frank? Job control is getting out of insurance. Mm -hmm. That's pretty rotten what you're doing. Yep. They're going to give you money. Mm -hmm. They point out that you buy, they, they have, is it four insurance companies they recommend? Well, one guy says, why can't we pick a fifth or six? Why can't we go to our own? And they don't know, so we don't know, we don't know. Dick Sillier called them up. Hello, everyone. I think we're going to get started a while, at least with announcements. Hopefully, we'll get a few more people tonight. Thank you all for coming again. Um, as I think I said last month, the, li oh, sorry. the Library and Archives is open uh, by reservation if you want to come and do research. Uh, we're open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 4. Um, all of our programs now are being live streamed on the History Center Facebook page and are going to be recorded and available on the History Center website. Uh, just to upcoming programs, we have some all kinds of stuff coming up, so I'll try to be quick. Uh, September 26th, that's this Saturday, we have an open hearth cooking demonstration at the Plow Tavern uh, for one, 11 to 1. We also have an oral history training webinar uh, that same afternoon. On October 4th, we, uh, the uh, Genealogy Society will be meeting and talking about everyone's experiences doing research during the quarantine. October 10th is Second Saturday, and that is Amanda Owen. Oh, let me adjust the sound on this. Not sure what's going on with that. Uh, Amanda Owen is going to speak about finding justice, the untold story of women's fight for the vote. Uh, we currently have an exhibit on women's suffrage upstairs, and there's a replica of the justice bell on exhibit right out here in the lobby. So if you get a chance, check that out before you leave tonight. Uh, October 10th through the 13th is our virtual oyster festival. For those of you that enjoy coming for the oysters, uh, we had to move it to an online program, but we do have online chef demonstrations, virtual tours, and there'll be a road rally scavenger hunt involved. Um, so check that out. Uh, October 21st, Civil War Roundtable. The speaker is Rick Schroeder and Fran Fayok talking about Civil War surgery and anesthesia. That's going to be a webinar. So October 21st. October 21st. And you can register for that on our website or give us a call and we'll help you register. Uh, the next All Vet speaker, um, we're still working on the next All Vet speaker. Yeah, we can. Okay. We're, we're, we'll yeah. see if we can get okay. a January, February speaker. So we had a cancellation for All Vets in October, but we're, uh, Linda's working on a, a, a person for that. So I think I'm ready to introduce our speaker for this evening. Uh, his name is Jeff Hines, and he, he was in the Army and is going to speak about his time in the Middle East and Afghanistan. So thank you very much. All right, well, thank you all for coming out tonight. And for those online, thanks for, for, uh, for logging on. Um, Again, my name is Jeff Hines. I've started my military career in 1980 when I uh, went to Bucknell University in the ROTC program. Got my commission through ROTC. And then uh, went from there to, uh, to the 5th Infantry Division in Fort Polk, Louisiana. And then some time with the Corps of Engineers in the uh, active and reserve. And spent a lot of time in the reserves and then came back on active duty after 9-11. So we'll talk to you briefly about my whole career and then focus in certainly on uh, Afghanistan. Uh, that's just my uh, biography. Uh, first a couple of people I'd like to thank. First is my, my grandfather, who I never knew, but he was an engineer officer in World War I. Served in the 24th Engineers in France, and his job was to build railroads uh, to the fighting troops. Fast forward to World War II, and my father served in the 25th Infantry Division in the U.S. Army in the South Pacific, and he was a, uh, he was a medical doctor. And he served starting in Guadalcanal and went all the way to Japan. I'd 
also like to thank any Vietnam veterans in the room. I'd like to thank the Vietnam veterans. When I came in the Army, uh, ROTC in 1980, the Vietnam veterans uh, were still, a lot of them were still on active duty, and they were so very important to my upbringing and training me in the ways of the Army. And uh, in particular, up in the upper right there, uh, Mike Worley. When I got deployed, got called up, uh, I was a vice president at the York Water Company in 2001, when 9 11 happened, and I got called up. And Mike Worley and his wife Patty came over and said, Jeff, whatever you need, and Patty, my wife Patty, in the back of the room, uh, whatever you need, Jeff, you just let us know. Same with you, Patty. Said, we understand what it's like, and we don't want you to be treated like we were treated. And Mike made sure when I came home, he gave me a huge hug and said, welcome home. That's so why I say to all Vietnam veterans in particular, welcome home. That was really neat. Um, also, thanks, Linda, for this wonderful program and your team.
Uh, this is me in the desert with a couple other officers. Uh, but the next morning, that's what the Jeep looked like when the bulldozer ran it over. In a kind of a training accident in the middle of the night, they were heading out of a fighting position from the, at the National Training Center, and the Jeep stopped, but the bulldozer didn't see him stop with all the dust, and rode right up on top of the Jeep, and stopped right before. Now, I was not in the Jeep at the time. I was back at the end of the, the convoy making sure everybody got on the road. And I just remember Sergeant Mouton calling me and said, sir, you better get up here. He got up there, and there he, he, I mean, this thing missed his back, I mean, by inches. Uh, so I spent the rest of that training exercise, it was probably a month-long training exercise, avoiding the post safety officers trying to find us so they could write an incident report. And of course, you know, when you're in the Army, you don't want anything to do with that. So uh, he never did catch us. Uh, this is another interesting, you know, you meet a lot of interesting people in the Army. And this was one, this was a brigade commander when I was in Fort Polk, Louisiana, Colonel Herbert Lloyd and his sergeant major, Command Sergeant Major Ivan Ho Love. And I gotta tell you, as a young lieutenant, one thing you always wanted to do when you're walking through the base or you're out on training exercise, if you saw either one of these guys coming at you, or both, you first off didn't make eye contact, and second, you know, ran for cover. Because uh, neither of these two gentlemen, and you can see right there, were never happy people. <laughs> and you can see, Colonel, uh, Colonel uh, Lloyd was a phenomenal soldier. He started off as an enlisted, did a couple tours in Vietnam, two, he did his two silver stars, a soldier's medal, seven bronze medals with V device, two purple hearts, combat CIB, master parachutes with three combat jumps. And, uh, and of course the Ranger tab, he was made the 1986 OCS Hall of Fame. But uh, I have to tell you a story about Colonel Lloyd. When I was in the desert with those six bulldozers, and we were building a big anti-tank ditch for the, uh, the war games that were going on. And uh, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. You could, you could look all around and not see a sign of anything. And all of a sudden, this helicopter comes out and lands right near me. And I thought to myself, oh boy, what's going on here? And out comes Colonel Lloyd. And I thought, oh boy, what's he got? Now? And so, you know, I snapped to attention, and I said, you know, Hello, sir. Uh, Lieutenant Hines with the uh, combat engineers. Would you like a situation report? And he goes, hell no. He says, but I do want you to tell me where the brigade talk is. Now, if you're not in the military, a talk is a tactical operations center. It's the brigade headquarters. Now, the, the, the wheels in my head that move fast were going to say, sir, you're the brigade commander. Don't you know where your headquarters is? <laughs> Fortunately, the slower moving wheels caught up to the faster moving wheels and told me to shut up. And uh, so I, I just said, uh, no, sir, I do not know where the brigade headquarters is. And uh, he says, well, that's just fine. And he says, hell of a job you're doing here. And he had made some you know, comments I can't repeat. Uh, but then he just stormed off, got back in his helicopter, flew off. And uh, I just shook my head. I said, boy, I, I know he was a, a renowned infantry commander, but uh, he did not leave a good impression for me there. Uh, so back at Fort Polk, uh, anybody know what that is? It's a, it's a backpack. It's a, they call it an ADM, Atomic Demolition Munition. It's an atomic bomb. Now that's a training version of an atomic bomb. It's not a real one. Uh, but they had three, back in the Cold War, Three uh, officers in every infantry or armored division were trained as an additional duty as atomic demolition officers. So the theory being, when the balloon goes up, the Soviets come across Germany, the 5th Infantry Division in Louisiana get on airplanes, fly to Belgium, pick up pre-positioned equipment, and, and drive towards the Soviets. And every division is supposed to have three officers that if you needed to really slow the Soviet army down and conventional techniques weren't working, well, here's something you could do. And uh, you needed presidential release orders, obviously, to use a nuclear bomb. And um, the way it would work is the division commander would say, hey, I, I need a, a nuclear bomb to blow up the auto bomb, put a really big hole in it, or perhaps to blow up a dam to flood an area so that the Russians couldn't get through. And uh, if he got approval for that, then uh, uh, 
two special forces guys would show up and they would each have a key and a code and I would then be given through the chain of command a code. And so if we really needed to place this, and feed me being the engineer officer, I understand how to uh, enhance terrain, right? Uh, you saw the bridging stuff there in the desert. So I could figure out where we need to blow up the Autobahn for the best effect, or how to, which dam to blow up to, to uh, slow the, the Russians down. So the three of us would then go to a site, plant this, they put their keys in and their code, I punch my code in, and then, as the story goes, you would set a timer in it, and you'd have a certain amount of time uh, to, to get out of there. And of course, the joke was, no, when you push the red button, it just blows up. <laughs> and uh, we don't, we never do. Uh, but, you know, another thing is, it was, uh, you know, I remember in the training that we were getting, I said, what about all the civilians in the area? And in the classic military way, that they would wave their hands in the air and say, the MPs would take care of that. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh boy. And, and of course you had to bury it or do something because you didn't want the Russians to get it. And like uh, kind of a, the mother of all grenades, they would, could get it and then somehow you know, put it behind our lines. Um, so you had to hide it somewhere when you, when you deployed it. So that was kind of an additional duty I had at Fort Falk, very interesting. Fortunately, never had to do anything with that. Uh, and those things are all taken out of the service, as I understand. So after Fort Polk, three years there, I went to Fort Belvoir, and I was a trainer for, for young engineer officers uh, that were coming into the Army. And they, at the time, the engineer school was at Fort Belvoir. Uh, it's now at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Uh, but I was, and then after five years of active duty, I went into the reserves, came here to York, Pennsylvania, and uh, started working at the York Water Company as their engineer, and I worked my way through that. But I did get deployed in 1994 to the uh, Northridge earthquake for 30 days, and I was put in charge of 75 engineers, and we were responsible for assessing buildings to make sure they were safe, and, uh, or if they weren't, to tag them, make sure nobody went in them. And that was a, quite an interesting uh, event. I actually stayed, uh, this is tough duty in some respects, uh, I stayed at the, the Beverly Hills Hilton Hotel. And so I would have these horrendous 20 hour days uh, with my 75 engineers all over the Los Angeles area. And at night I'd come back covered in dust in my, in my uh, battle dress. At the time it was you know, that dark green uh, camouflage one here. And I would uh, uh, come back just coated in dust and walk through the lobby of the Beverly Hills Hilton and some gala event was going on. You know, a people's black tie event, but it just kind of felt really strange. Uh, kind of uh, two worlds there. Uh, a very interesting uh, tour of duty. Uh, also, as a reservist, I didn't do much uh, other than you know, my two weeks were kind of in the area. I did help uh, Voice of America. They were building a bunch of transmitters kind of uh, uh, late in the Reagan uh, and, and uh, first Bush presidencies and uh, helped uh, kind of with uh, design for Voice of America projects across the world. Also, that's the Walter Reed. Uh, Army Research Center did some work there, and they were building that uh, as part of my kind of two-week annual training. Uh, but nothing really exciting until, of course, 9-11. And uh, that is the inside of a sniper scope uh, that I, I saw in Afghanistan. And just a reminder of the sniper why he was there. We all knew why we were there. So, you know, 9-11 happened. Uh, October 7th, I got orders for uh, to deploy for a year, and um, I went to, of all places, Dallas, Texas, for a month of training, uh, and then deployed with the 3rd Army to Kuwait. And what, the way it worked is the 3rd Army was in charge of the land battle in Afghanistan. And the 3rd Army normal headquarters was in, was in Georgia, they deployed to Kuwait, and I spent most of the year in Kuwait that I was deployed. Uh, but it was the War Against Terrorism, and that was the Third Army logo for it. Third Army, of course, Patton's own in World War II. We all know the, their great tradition and honor. Uh, but it was a huge theater. And uh, it, uh, it had many challenges. And the engineers, you always like to 
saying we're everywhere you need to be. Uh, and without us, you can't get there. And Afghanistan, of course, is a landlocked country. And the first challenge we had in December of 2001 was how to attack Afghanistan, the, uh, the, the, in particular the Taliban and uh, Al-Qaeda. And uh, as you can see, uh, it's kind of the, some of the battles that were occurring. Early on, it was special forces teams working with uh, allies, the Northern Alliance, uh, to push back the Taliban, but we needed to get a large maneuver force in, and the, the plans were to take the Kandahar airfield. But you couldn't just fly into Kandahar, and so what they did was um, uh, Operation uh, Rhino, where the, the Marines, the 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit, which is floating at sea, it gets deployed to a desert airstrip in Afghanistan and then marches and takes the Kandahar airfield. So imagine the logistics of that. First off, you have uh, 1,100 Marines sitting on those ships. How do they get to Afghanistan? They have helicopters and boats. The boats, of course, can't get them to Afghanistan. The helicopters is too far to fly across Pakistan to get them to Afghanistan. So what they did was they worked with the Pakistanis, had a, a very un, a seldom used airfield, an emergency airfield, that was right near the uh, Indian Ocean. And we somehow diplomatically got authorization to use that. And so they, the Marine Expeditionary Unit came ashore like they normally do in boats and helicopters to this airfield. And then the Air Force picked them up in uh, C-17s and C-130s and flew to this desert airstrip in Afghanistan. And that's how we got our first combat elements into Afghanistan. And there you can see uh, Objective Rhino with a C-130 there, and engineer equipment building the airfield out to, to be able to land more flights. So I got involved with that uh, kind of towards the end, and the, the base in uh, Pakistan was called Pozni Air Force Base, and it was the Pakistani Air Force. And uh, ironically, the Marines land, the Air Force comes, picks them up, flies them into Afghanistan, or maybe bring the Marines in. The, the Air Force picks the Marines up, flies to Afghanistan, and when the dust settles, they tell the Army to go fix the airfield. <laughs> so uh, myself and this Navy CB uh, we kind of met at this air base. We were the only two Americans there, literally uh, over a thousand miles from any other American. And our job is to figure out how to fix the airfield, because what we found, oh, there's a picture of me at the time, I was the president of the York Roadrunners Club, and I had to do, I, I, so I, I did a little, uh, you know, I went out for a run on the airfield. Airstrip's 10,000 feet long, you know, I'd run back and forth twice, like a four mile run. And I remember getting back, and the, uh, the, the, the base commander, a group captain from Pakistan, said, Major Hines, you gotta stop doing that, okay? He said, I have 200 soldiers on this base. He said, I cannot guarantee that they're all loyal to Pakistan. <laughs> And they're all armed. I said, Roger that, sir. No more running on the base. <laughs> um, but this is, <clears throat> first of all, how we got there. Uh, you know, actually, this is uh, C-130 to Bagram Air Base. And I'll fill you in a little bit on that. But one of the problems, and here's Bagram Air Base. Uh, when we got there in March of 2002, the U.S. had just taken it over like a month or so before. Uh, Special Forces teams had come in taken it over, and we started flying in there. Uh, but it was just this boneyard of old Soviet equipment. That was their major base for 10 years. And this was the, uh, this was kind of their uh, compound, which we called Motel 6. You can see a little problem with their roof, a little bit wet when it rained. Uh, but that was, that was the US Army headquarters at the time. Uh, also, when we got to the Bagram Air Force Base, uh, it was right at the heat of the first big uh, Army operation, uh, where the, uh, a brigade from the 101st Airborne uh, was flying out uh, in Operation Anaconda to this valley to take on the Taliban. And uh, this is the soldiers uh, filing into CH-47s uh, to fly into the combat zone. This was also the battle of a local connection uh, this is the battle that uh, 
Petty Officer Neil Roberts was killed, uh, one of the first casualties up on, a, uh, up on the ridge top. Uh, and it's a tragic story, uh, but he died a hero, and a number of folks died trying to rescue him. Um, but that was all part of the same battle while I, we were in Bar Barham Air Base. Uh, and and uh, 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 Petty Officer Roberts is buried in the uh, uh, cemetery here in New York. Uh, this is Apache helicopters. And the Apache helicopters supported the 101st Airborne in this attack. Well, every one of those Apache helicopters got shot up. They still all completed their mission. None of them crashed. Amazing piece of aircraft. But they all had holes. They were riddled with holes. And so a lot of them were out of service. And they quickly realized we need more close air support here. The Apaches aren't going to, obviously we can't fly to Apaches in. Remember, it's landlocked again. And it's a long way to uh, a batch of Apaches. However, they could fly A-10s in. Uh, they could fly them from anywhere in the world. And so A-10s flew in. And uh, they took up the close air support role while the Apaches were getting repaired. Uh, but from a civil engineer perspective, uh, by the way, you know what the difference between a civil engineer and a mechanical engineer are? You heard this one? In, 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 uh, in, in war, the mechanical engineer builds weapons, the civil engineer builds targets. <laughs> so, so we're building, obviously we're in charge of building runways. And let's see if I have this. The, the runways in Afghanistan were built in the lower left for 50,000 pound fighters, the Soviet MiGs. They were landing million pound C-5s and C, uh, or uh, uh, cargo versions of 747 and even Russian Antonov uh, 124s. Million pound aircraft on a runway designed for 50,000 pounds. Well, it chews up the runway, it looks like that. And it doesn't last long. And when the runway at Bagram is your sole life support for your entire war effort, you put a lot of resources into getting that fixed. And we could not take the runway out of service for any length of time. We were constantly having planes flying in with supplies, troops, everything. And so how do you fix that? And um, one thing you do is it's a 10,000 foot runway, about 150 feet wide. A C-130 or C-17 only needs 3,000 feet of runway and only needs about 75 feet to it. So you actually divide your runway into four, let them actively land on one quarter, and start fixing the other three quarters at the same time. And so it was very dicey while we were doing this because the runways were crumbling as we were landing aircraft on it. But then, remember those A-10s came into the computer. Well, an A-10 doesn't need 3,000 feet. An A-10 needs 10,000 feet. And so now we have to divide the runway in half. You know, one half active, one half under construction. And again, we could never close it down while we're doing all this. And so actually we came up with a creative solution. Actually the Brits that were there with us, the British Army the engineers, had started this process. We actually started harvesting squares. You see this Russian runway is made of big concrete squares, like 10 foot by 10 foot. And so we'd take a, we would take a measure, a piece that needed to be replaced, go to the edge of the runway, cut out a 10 foot by 10 foot square, lift it up and replace these crumbled squares with a clean one. And then they started building squares out of uh, concrete that was flown in and build your own kind of square and then start using that to replace. It was very touch and go, kind of literally, for quite a while. Now this is another thing. Anybody know what that is? It's a Predator drone. That's an unmanned aerial vehicle. And the uh, problem they had, those were phenomenal. Well, what they did for the war effort, and no pilots were, were harmed because they were unmanned. Uh, but the wheels on those things are actually almost literally lawnmower wheels. And they quickly discovered that they couldn't land these at any of the fields in Afghanistan because they had a lot of lumps and holes, and they didn't want to damage these million dollar predators. And so the engineers had to, again, kind of very quickly come up with a solution to get the, the, the predators to land. The new Predators actually have much beefier tires, probably because of this problem they had. But we actually had to create a smooth area of runway for the Predators to land on. So more challenges. I remember going to visit the Predator base, actually in Kuwait. That's where the pilots were at the time. 
know where the pilots are for most of these now? Las Vegas. That's right. Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, the beauty of satellite communication. Uh, but the, the pilots for most of the predators were in, in Kuwait. And I remember going to visit them on their air base, and they had this tombstone with like four numbers on it. And I asked the guy, I says, what is that? It's the four predators that never came home. <laughs> so instead of losing human lives, we lost four pieces of hardware. If a man was standing beside that, yeah. six foot man, where would his head come from? Uh, the, the, the wing would be up like mid chest. Oh. It's like a small Piper or a Cessna as far as size. How long the runway did you need for that? Oh, they, they were okay with 3,000 feet easy. Yeah, they, they could use less. It's kind of entertaining. There's some books written later on, especially in Iraq. The problem with the predators is to, to bring them into flight operations with an act, in an active airport. All the other planes have a pilot that can see. This thing doesn't. So, you know, it doesn't know what's left or right. So they had a lot of problems with landing. You know, you, you'd, have to, uh, you'd have to have somebody standing at the side of the runway to land it, just like a big RC plane. Uh, and then immediately run like a Humvee or a Jeep out to it and escort it back in so that all the other aircraft knew that here's a dummy aircraft they can't see. Don't run into it. And vice versa. Uh, another thing we did in Afghanistan uh, was uh, we assisted with um, uh, destroying caves. And uh, I remember they came in and we, I, I didn't do any of this myself. Uh, I was in the engineer headquarters, but uh, uh, we did do some of the design calculations for how much explosives they needed to make four before, uh, through proper planning, that's the 101st Airborne Division again, we work very closely with them, uh, so that it looks like that after they're done. And I don't know if there's anybody in that cave, but there will never be anybody again. The other thing we did as engineers is mine clearing, and uh, this is in uh, Bagram Air Force Base again, and that's a, uh, a mine, uh, a, an armored D-7 bulldozer. We had a lot of different things to clear mines. Uh, one of them was dogs, we got dogs. Uh, we actually hired con contractors from Eastern Europe. They had the best mine dogs for some reason. Uh, simple mine detectors, especially at the Bagram Air Base when we got there. And I remember my, my first day there, going out, uh, looking around, doing things, and coming back, and the, the, the main road, which is called Disney Drive, uh, uh, named after a, a soldier who was killed, and uh, it was all cordoned off because the dogs were going out to a known minefield, and one of them hit on a mine right in the kind of the, the, the berm of the road, right in the uh, swale. And uh, fortunately, nobody had stepped on it up to that point, but the, the place is just polluted with mines. And the bottom is a mine flail, and we had two of them initially, one from, and it was a very world events, especially early on. We had two mine flails, one from um, the Netherlands, uh, I'm sorry, Denmark, and one from Jordan. And the one from Denmark did phenomenal work. The one from Jordan, anybody from Jordan here? Just want to make sure I don't start an international incident. But the uh, way those guys would work until like noon and then they were done. You know, they had no motivation whatsoever. And, uh, but uh, but a very impressive machine, nonetheless. Uh, my favorite uh, uh, gift uh, that was sent to me, of course, is Cheez-Its. Uh, this is me on an airfield uh, in, actually this is in Qatar. I, I visited six countries when I was deployed to do engineer missions. And, um, and the gentleman in the middle of us there uh, is, is uh, and I can't remember his name, but he told us, and I have no reason to doubt him, that he was the oldest enlisted man in the Air Force at that time. He was 64 years old. 64. Yep. He looked great. Uh, that's actually the same person there that flew with me on this mission. Uh, it's a guy named J.T. Hand. He was a colonel at the time, also worked in the engineer branch, and the Army can be a small place. I came back to New York after my deployment, went back to the York Water Company, and like four years later, he retired from the Army and was looking for uh, a, uh, a job and a place to settle down. And uh, he actually moved to York and was working in Baltimore. He called me and says, hey, Jeff, are you still in New York? I said, yes, I just bought a house there. <laughs> so we got back together. And uh, long story short, he's a sharp, very sharp guy. And uh, he's now the, 
I was the president of the York Water Company when I retired on March 1st, and he's now the president of the York Water Company. Awesome. If you have any problems with your water bill, JT Hans, the guy you can talk to. Uh, that's, you know, one of those things I mentioned about our Vietnam veterans uh, leading the way. And uh, this is the inside of my Kevlar helmet. And like soldiers from generations ago, you always put your loved ones on a photograph in your helmet, don't you? And that's what was in my helmet. Uh, another shot of me, and this is actually, so my first eight months, uh, seven months in Kuwait was focused on Afghanistan. And then we did a change, a handoff, where we changed uh, the 18th Airborne Corps, ran the Afghanistan fight, and the 3rd Army started planning the attack into Iraq. And so I got, uh, do you remember that atomic demolition early on? I got a top secret clearance to be able to do that, and I still had my top secret clearance. So at one point they said, Anybody here with a top secret clearance? You know, it's one of those things, sometimes you're not supposed to uh, volunteer when you're in the Army, you always hear that. Well, I volunteered. I said, sure. And uh, this is outstanding. We need you on the engineer planning team. And I, I was involved in the planning for the attack into Iraq. But one of the things from Kuwait, there are, there's a brigade uh, equipment uh, preposition in Kuwait of a heavy brigade. There's another brigade in Qatar just down the coast. And then there's a third brigade on 17 ships based in Diego Garcia out in the Indian Ocean. And so those three brigades were slowly infiltrating into Kuwait in, in anticipation of attacking Iraq. And it was quite fascinating. Uh, we all we were trying to do this to, to not uh, make sure Saddam and his spies didn't get too, uh, give them too much information. Uh, so I remember, you know, we lived in a warehouse in Kuwait uh, with a thousand soldiers. Picture that. And now it was probably a room this big with kind of with like cinder block walls, with probably 50 soldiers in here, and the walls were so that if one artillery round hit, it wouldn't kill a thousand soldiers. It would kill 50. Uh, but we lived in these giant warehouses that were transformed. Uh, but the warehouses before they housed soldiers housed all this equipment. So we moved that kind of out into the desert uh, as troops flew in to man it, and we took over the warehouses as our living quarters. And, uh, but it was just fascinating to open the doors to a warehouse and see all this equipment lined up, ready to go. Very, very awesome. I remember one day I had a Marine friend, um, and every morning we were there, we'd go for a run around our base. And uh, one day we were running around the base, the next day, Got up, you know, went running around the base, and there had to be 300 M1 tanks that were not there the night before. And they all came in off of a ship from Diego Garcia, and stuff like that. Every night, buses of drivers would, would go out to the port, and it, in the darkness, bring back all this combat equipment, so that by daylight, they were all parked, and that was that. But uh, I remember my Marine friends were running around the base, and he said, honest to God, Jeff, he said, you just, you, the Army, just brought in more tanks than the Marine Corps owns. I said, well, you know, it's a combined fight, isn't it? You know, they, they get the first 30 days to beat down the enemy, but then we're there for the, for the long haul. Uh, so, but uh, uh, pretty amazing stuff. We had to do the plan for that. Uh, here I am in Islamabad, Pakistan, on a different mission, uh, assessing airfields. And we had to wear civilian clothes a lot because we didn't want to raise anybody's suspicions. Uh, there I am, <laughs> it's, it's at the big theater, and it's amazing how in a day you can be in two different places. It's kind of cold there, you see the White Cap Mountains in Bagram, uh, you know, but then the next day I'm in the deserts of Kuwait or um, uh, Bahrain or Oman uh, working on projects. Uh, again, that's back in the deserts. Um, yeah, I mentioned the attack into Iraq, and I remember when I first got that mission, and they said, it's, uh, here's, they said, Jeff, I can't tell you what the mission is. So your top secret clips? Yeah. All right. I can't tell you what the mission is, but you have to report to the Blue Room. And I knew where the Blue Room was, and of course, being soldiers, I knew what the mission was. It was attacking Iraq, but that's all I knew. But I remember going in there, getting kind of coded in, and the doors opened, and seeing this giant wall map that essentially looked like that. And it had 21 Iraqi combat divisions arrayed on it, 21. You know, the US Army at the time might have had 14 active duty combat divisions. And they're all over the world. And so 
last five months of my employment, uh, I, I assisted in kind of the engineer aspect of invading and taking over Iraq. And remember how I talked about that kind of hand wave you saw sometimes where, you know, those MPs will take care of all the innocent civilians. Don't worry about it. Well, the question came up, all right, after we attack through all these divisions and wipe them out, um, who's going to be there to to police the civilians and, and monitor what's going on? And the hand comes up and says, that's, they call it G5, kind of public affairs uh, and uh, uh, civil government, affairs. civil affairs folks. Yes, thank you. The civil affairs folks will take care of that. And uh, there aren't enough civil affairs folks to take care of an entire country, especially when they're a little bit hostile. Uh, nonetheless, the attack itself was, as you know, a phenomenal success. And uh, we went right through all those divisions. And a great combined force between the, uh, the Marines, the Army, uh, the Navy, and the Air Force, you know, it just, uh, uh, it was just a tremendous uh, win for us. I mentioned about uh, the warehouses full of equipment. And we could. We, we had to. We had two lists of things we had to do. One was, uh, you know, kind of obvious things, where if the if if Saddam and his henchmen saw it, it would be obvious we're planning an attack. If they didn't, it was like, uh, you know, maybe the Americans are just training, or forces are coming through here on their way to Afghanistan, which was happening. And uh, one of the, uh, uh, as an engineer, we had to figure out. Remember those float bridges you saw early on. Well, we had to figure out how much float bridging we needed to capture Iraq. And with the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, the Saddam Canal, all kinds of water sources that may need to be crossed if the bridges get blown, or even if we still needed other ways to get across. The U.S. Army has 12 float bridge companies. Each one puts about 200 meters, two, two football fields of bridging out. We have 12 in the entire army. The Marine Corps had two. So between us, we had 14 bridge companies. We quickly said, if the Iraqis blow all of those bridges in, in uh, Iraq, we're going to need all 14 bridge companies. And the army, you know, the people that moved, the Air Force guys said, well, we don't have the lift to bring 14 bridge companies, at least not for six weeks. So, well, no, we need the bridges early. You know, we can't wait. So very fascinating discussions about logistics and timing. And uh, <coughs> convincing the other Air Force, the fighting Air Force, not to blow up bridges, <laughs> said, uh, you know, that was always, uh, they had a target list that showed every bridge between Kuwait and Baghdad, they were going to blow up, you know, fighters and bombers were going to blow them up. And we're like, no, no, you need to relook that. Why? Because it, you know, it takes a tremendous amount of resources to rebuild a bridge. And uh, through kind of our engineer, senior manager, senior leaders, we convinced the Air Force not to blow the bridges. Kind of be on call to blow them if it gets ugly, but don't just blow them for the sake of blowing. But the Air Force loves to blow up bridges. You know why? They don't move. That's right. They just sit there. Same thing with airfields. They love putting holes in airfields because they don't move. Uh, we're, again, we said the same thing. Don't blow up the airfield. Just blow up the little aircraft that are around it. That's all you need to do. We really want to use that airfield. Uh, so uh, another one of those logistic challenges we got through. Oh, uh, yeah, so one of those, uh, I think we eventually had four engineer companies come in. But that was one of those things where it was obvious what we were doing if, if Saddam's men saw engineer companies. Because I mentioned you saw the, the rivers in, in Iraq. You know how many rivers are in Kuwait? No. None. So you couldn't say, well, yeah, the Americans are doing river crossing operations in Kuwait. No, they're, they're coming here. Um, so those, we had to like take out the artillery and park them inside buildings. I remember one time, one night, going into a building like this, uh, a, a uh, warehouse, completely empty, and the next morning going in it, and there were 100 10,000 gallon fuel tankers that came in off the ships, just lined up in there. And of course, you know, an army needs fuel to, to, to move. And we needed a tremendous amount of fuel to get to Baghdad. And so that was one of our challenges 